Just, and everyone. You believe in yourself? Uh -huh. Do you yeah. believe in yourself as God? Yeah, when I'm hippo, <laughs> I do. And how often are you hippo? Is that something you've maybe taken as a part of yourself now? I definitely feel like um, there are, maybe, maybe there are parts of me that uh, feel a little hippo, but I like to think I'm not hippo. But, I, but I, we share some similarities. We definitely look alike. Very similar. Uh, his hair is a little less curly, but uh, other than curly. that, it's a dead ringer. It is a dead ringer. Excellent. Well, what you've been overhearing is some oblique discussion of the film that we're going to dive into. My name is Giles Edwards from 366 Weird Movies. And fate has intervened to allow me to chat with the lead actor and the director of photography, who were supposed to be out of town yesterday, but instead are in town through tomorrow. And uh, if you would uh, both care to introduce yourselves, please. Uh, my name is Kimmel Farley. I uh, play Hippo in the film Hippo, and I uh, co-wrote it with Mark and um, I'm, uh, William Backpack, I'm the cinematographer, director of photography. All right, now this is uh, from the introduction, I was informed, a very personal film for a number of people involved, certainly the director. Mm -hmm. You say you co wrote it. Co wrote it. And uh, were you, uh, are you more of a visitor to this world, or do you have a long history of? whatever those two suffered from? Uh, maybe a tiny bit of crossover. Um, at the very least, we're done. Me and Kimball met on a short film that we did that preceded this with Mark as director um, with similar thematic elements. Um, and we kind of carried that on through Hippo as a continuation. OK. Well, Hippo is a story set in the mid to late 90s in Pennsylvania. Uh, shot entirely in the grandmother's house of Mark Rappaport. Mark's, Mark Rappaport's grandmother provided a wonderful 70s era, mid-century modern style enclosed world for uh, the mother character and her two endearing children, one of them adopted of Hippo, as uh, mentioned, uh, born Adam, yes, is the uh, legal name of the character. And uh, they adopted, and they very clearly emphasize on many occasions, stepsister Buttercup. Mm -hmm. Now, this is uh, something of an odd movie, has something of a strange tone to it, and it explores a number of very personal uh, elements and themes, fears, concerns, and uh, the kinds of things, growing up in a conservative religious household. Now, you were mentioning just before I turned this on that you have a Mormon background, and I believe the director has an Orthodox Jewish background. Yes, I uh, I grew up Mormon. I don't. I'm not anymore. I don't consider myself really religious at all anymore. Um, and Mark grew up um, Orthodox Jew. Yes. Orthodox, correct. Yes, um, and um, and yeah, it definitely informed a lot of uh, my upbringing and Marks, and I and of course informed the script. I am, I think uh, a lot of Mormons grow up a little sheltered, and Hippos definitely sheltered. To put it lightly, to put it rather lightly, <laughs> he he seems to know two people, and they are the ones living with him. So. They are the ones with living with him. And Darwin. And Darwin. Three people. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> How could I forget the delightful <laughs> visitor? Uh, yes, Darwin was uh, quite a breath of fresh air there. So when writing the script, um, like roughly how long did it take? What kind of tone alliterations did it have? When did it snap into place that it was kind of had to be a comedy? If you might uh, expand a little bit on that part of the process, please. Yeah, so what's funny is um, when me and Mark were writing it, so whenever me and Mark write, we, uh, it's, like a, you know, it's, it's like a FaceTime session in which you're just kind of laughing and chatting. And, um, and he really oversees the story at large. And, 
and then I oversee my character, and so he'll be like, "Would you think? Do you think your character would do this? Do you think this would happen?" And I, um, and it's nice because it kind of gives me as an actor uh, an opportunity to almost already play the character before we start filming, and like get to live with him longer. And what's funny is when we were writing it, I don't think, I mean, we definitely, I think there was. We definitely were thinking it would be like a dark comedy, but weirdly we were leaning more towards like, oh, this is like a dark drama thriller. Um, and we wrote a lot of funny like lines, but we were thinking it would almost come off more like we need to talk about Kevin or something. And it was all I think I think what helped was the lines were so weird, but the characters are taking it so seriously, like it's Shakespeare, and so you're not playing it for a joke. Like no, the characters don't even know that there is a joke. Yeah. Um, and so, it, I think that helped it become funnier. Definitely, and I'd like to ask you, director of photography, because yes, there's the script world, there's the acting world, but it's uh, you with your camera constructing the claustrophobia that uh, needs to be inflicted on the audience to give them a taste of what's going on here. I wonder if you might uh, be willing to talk a little bit about your process for that. Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of that, of course, was dictated by the location, which ended up being kind of perfect in the end. In his grandma's house, I kind of come. We did, you know, with an amazing production designer, uh, Rebecca, who came on and helped us, but a lot of what you see on stream was kind of already there, considering her house was kind of a time capsule of the 70s and 80s. A lot of wood panels, a lot of furniture from that time, a lot, you know, um, and had that bond filter thing down in the basement that we already took advantage of. That was. That was in, that was another room in her basement that we just yeah we Excellent. added some drama <laughs> but it was it was there you know um, and we didn't shoot yeah everything takes place entirely in that one house in that one location at Mark's grandma's house so that kind of dictated it um, but me and Mark had always talked in the beginning about it kind of being this bubble contained like outside in the story itself <coughs> taking place in reality for sure but almost feeling this sort of uh, very careless, storybookish type of world, um, and so everything in the photography was kind of working towards that end to kind of have it feel the big reason we shot in black and white was kind of, at least from my perspective was, as Kimball was kind of saying, when I first read the script, it didn't exactly read as a comedy per se. I actually had a little bit of issue. I was like, how is this going to, is this going to be mean spirited? Is this going to land? How is this going to come across? Um, this is a short film me and Mark and Kimball had done together. It was a bit more serious. It had some moments of levity, but um, definitely heavier without that kind of, mm -hmm. yeah, other side to it. Um, but the, once we got on set and once I met all the actors and they came together, it just, those like people saying those lines, I mean, it works because they're very, everything's taken seriously. There's no irony, there's no, you know, uh, wall breaking, which I think is a problem with a lot of modern filmmaking. <laughs> I really appreciate the movie takes itself seriously and then allows that comedy to kind of happen. Yeah, I, I've only had the pleasure of seeing it the once and so, uh, my, and amongst a number of films so far this festival, but I'm kind of curious uh, uh, also in regards to photography. You have your three main characters, and of course Darwin shows up and does Darwin's thing. Was there any uh, different treatment you had for the character vis-a-vis, -vis, like, you know, how close you got to them, yes. what angle you like for them, and if you yeah. might uh, comment on <coughs> um, why and how? Yeah, so, I mean, I'd like to think that the film is pretty cohesive when it comes to that, but. Um, so for one example, actually, the entire movie is pretty locked off, right? Everything is very isolated, the camera really moves, it does, it's a zoom or a very slow dolly move. Um, but in moments when we're with uh, Lilla, uh, Buttercup, character Buttercup, alone are the only times we go handheld, and those are meant to be kind of in her world, and potentially more subjective, but just sort of outside the bounds of the rest of the film, which is so rigid. Um, we use more diffusion when we were with her, even like a more kind of dreamy, ethereal mm -hmm. kind of vibe. Yeah, and that, uh, that makes sense uh, to me because in a way, uh, as much as Hippo dominates and certainly the title of the movie, she is kind of the heroine of this tale. And yes, that uh, uh, hand tell, that diffusion makes me think, yes, this is like the, the dark nightmare that she is doing her best with her limited capacities to get through and in her way out of. And the thing we did also, uh, lensing-wise, is I don't know this that stuff I just talked about at the handheld that was from the from the get-go, but something we kind of found and 
kind of found in the making of the movie is that we, I think Mark and me talked about this and Kimball as well, is that even a after we started shooting, we started realizing more and more this was Buttercup story. And in the end, you know, that was kind of the more apparent. So during shooting, especially towards the second half of the story, we started uh, shooting her in a slightly longer lens, especially when people are in scenes together. Everybody, we shot the vast majority of the film on a 32 millimeter uh, lens, which is pretty wide for Portugal. It was kind of the vibe we were going for. And then we would, in some later scenes, we often isolate her on a 50 mil just to give her a slightly different vibe and kind of the walls are closing in on her in a sense. And just to kind of have the, just, to, you know, it's not too noticeable and definitely being more subconscious for most audiences, but just a little bit something else to. Uh, no. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, let's swing back to uh, our, our actor-writer here. Uh, the, the lead, uh, the titular character is, is a fascinating specimen. And you were remarking about how you were pleased to be able to, in the creation process, start getting into it. Uh, how do you transfer yourself from the uh, calm, affable young fellow I'm chatting with now and chatted with at the bar into the uh, comparatively intense character hippo. Um, you know, it's a good question. I think um, I think something that uh, helped me a lot was um, I really just realized hippo is a child. Like he's a, he's really a case of arrested development. So I um, I really approached him like he was like nine years old because he's always throwing like temper tantrums. And so like one of the things I would do, this is kind of weird, but I really love drawing, and so like something that would help me is I had this little black book that I had like pictures taped in of like um, inspirations for the character, and just weird people that have existed throughout time. And, um, and uh, but another thing I did is I would draw pictures of hippos, and I made, I'd make sure that the pictures of the hippos were nice, but then I would color them in with a red crayon, like outside of the lines on purpose and make them look very disturbing and weird. And I, and, and I, would, all, I would look at that a lot before a take because it just helped me remember. And so I think he's, he's really this character that has no emotional, uh, he doesn't really have much emotion to him, but he's, um, but at the same time he cares about his family, but he's, but he's also very um, wrong about kind of everything. You know what I mean? <laughs> and um, so it was, it was, Hard, but not. But it was also like I'm just going. I'm just going to be a child, uh, a very a child with a lot of rage. You know, um, I don't know if that makes much sense. Oh no, I, don't know. I, I think that uh, certainly makes as much sense as we can hope for it. So, yeah, you know, I, I understand that uh, there are inexpressible parts of this process, as I've you know, I, I've chatted with a number of. Yeah, yeah. Uh, people who have had to be uh, not themselves for extended periods of time, and it's uh, but it still brings a smile to my face. Just like okay, you know, I watch this movie, I see this kind of person for ninety minutes, for two hours, or whatever it is, and then all of a sudden I stumble into whoever they might be, and it's like oh, well, that that that's the kind of person that you know I'm I'm in a dark street, and I'm I'm pleased to see them, as opposed to you know whoever they might have been portraying at the time uh, yeah, yeah. For, for the film. So yes, the the craft of acting is. Uh, is, uh, well, when done well, of course, is, is one of the main reasons that uh, we, we watch and you, uh, you people create there. Thank you, yeah. Um, now, there, there is a transition. Well, I suppose there are probably more than one, but there's a major transition, and I'm just sort of curious just to pursue this line a little further. There's the transition of Hippo at the start, very much the uh, grown-up, you know, big child character, uh, but then uh, upgrades to the black suit. Yeah, yeah. Now, did you shift anything yourself uh, in the performance of Hippo for that? A little bit, yeah. I think we, we kind of almost saw it as this arc because at the beginning he's wearing all these Hawaiian shirts and all these like um, childish, maybe not that Hawaiian shirts are childish, but just more colorful, exuberant clothes to like portray his childishness. And um, everything's very baggy and doesn't fit him. And um, and then in the middle of the film, he he realizes he's an adult. He's turning 19. He wants to wear what his father wore, and he wants. To, he's inspired by this agent in this video game. So he wears a suit. And then by the end of the film, he's wearing tactical gear. And I think there's three hippos in the movie, and they get progressively darker and more um, insane. 
Now, as a director of photography, I imagine uh, you pursued uh, from your side of the camera this uh, progression, certainly into uh, synchronizing better with the color scheme as Hippo effectively, literally, becomes the black and white background, having dyed his hair, black suit, then tactical gear, and so on. Did your, uh, you know, I understand the, you, know, you uh, started treating Buttercup differently uh, in the second half as you, you know, became more familiar with what she was about and the movie was about in her context. Did you have any changes in your camera treatment or lighting treatment for Hippo as he went down his particular path? Yeah, I'm trying to think. It wasn't necessarily sober consciously, but in watching the film this two times this week, I definitely we had moved towards slightly wider lensing on him, and more physically imposing. You definitely see that in the scene when the psychiatrist comes up, the doctor comes up to him, and you know, we play it. He's kind of imposing. The camera gets lower. Um, I actually have a pet. The opposite of the rest of the movie was my constant refrain to my uh, dolly grip was boom up, tilt down, which was constantly, and I was always very mindedly moving the dolly and the camera inch here, inch here, inch, inch here, which was often up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. And so towards the end, I think we kind of went a little bit the opposite direction to kind of give this character a bit more, you know, he's getting darker and darker and falling more into this. Um, and again, it wasn't something that necessarily was super, uh, I think it just kind of, you know, that was kind of what felt right at the time. Um, and then as far as other stuff, it's credit to the costume room you know, mm -hmm. and the work everybody else did to kind of have that come across. Uh, there's one character I want to ask specifically about, uh, and this is not to ignore uh, Buttercup too much, nor the uh, wonderful performance of the mother. There is one scene where we get, gosh, a third or fourth hand glimpse of the father character. Uh, this, uh, we find, well, he's mentioned early on in the, you know, the uh, Anderson style narration that, uh, you know, comes in and out throughout the film. But it's when Hippo discovers his father's letter. Uh, how involved in the story, I guess this is probably going back to, you know, pre-formal script for it, is this uh, nebulous father character who is the uh, all, uh, all too unfortunately absent voice of reason that could have impacted this family, could have been in this unit, except now he's just reduced to a bad memory and one piece of paper. Uh, what were the thoughts behind it? What were what? What's his story? I guess if you can say quickly. So I, we really thought that like, there's an entire parallel universe that like if Hippo's father still lived, um, I really think that Hippo and um, Buttercup could have been out of that situation. And it's definitely not a knock to Ethel because she's a wonderful mother at heart, but but she does have a case of. Um, uh, her own mental illness as well that, um, that we think in the backstory of everything she had almost like a, an, a moment where similar to how you hear, hear these crazy stories of QAnon type people believing that um, their families their families like a bunch of lizards and they like end up you hear something horrible like they uh, kill their entire family on the news um, it's uh, like she almost had this moment where she really believed that her husband was an alien um, or at least like um, usurped by aliens and and she had to get rid of him and so what's funny is you only really have that letter at the end there telling you that that story and we thought how funny it would be to have this huge letter that in any nor in, in any other movie this letter would really dictate where the rest of the story goes because it's like wow here's there's here's this groundbreaking bit of information like He's learning about his father. It seems like Ethel did something dangerous. Um, he and and he, the father wanted to get Hippo and Baglarka somewhere safe, and um, but you but you end up realizing something happened. I mean, obviously there's dirt in the backyard that shows the father died, and um, and uh, and what's funny is Hippo writes it off as he he said she said schoolyard nonsense, mm -hmm. and then he because it doesn't fit into his grand plan, you know? He doesn't have time for the dramas of life, but... That's right, at that point he very much has a mission. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's excellent. Uh, I guess uh, while, while I have you uh, here, um, I'm, I like to ask a, a sort of token question. Uh, 
like for you, like a, a shot that, uh, you know, or a sequence that you filmed that uh, you're particularly pleased with, that uh, you think you really caught a moment there with your, uh, with your camera and uh, your, you know, your uh, behind the scenes work, and uh, for you after that, uh, your favorite hippo moment, perhaps. It's not the most uh, uh, visually arresting or exciting scene, but probably just what went into the, uh, the dinner scene with Darwin, all four of them. We did that took, I think we shot an entire day on that, like 10 hours, right? Mm -hmm. Was it a whole day? I think it was before and after, yeah, almost 12 hours because we wanted to get an intense amount of coverage. So it was the four people around the table, each get close ups, each get a 45 degree angle close up, a wide shot, two two shots. Uh, a third angle on, on Buttercup, mm -hmm. um, and getting all that, I mean, it was a huge ask of the actors to have to perform the scene, you know, a picture amount of takes, basically, in the end. Um, and to have that kind of all work, and uh, and the eye lines, and all, you know, all that yeah. shit kind of work out in the end, and see it there, and get it working. Um, and also because it's in a film that's not super dialogue heavy, especially for long sequences, it's a lot of narration. Yeah. And narration. Um, this is our one, I mean, there's a couple other videos, but this one's the main big one, it's like a seven, eight minute scene. And to see that all kind of work uh, on a day that was extremely difficult. Really, no, really hard. Yeah. Well, I, I can definitely understand that. The yeah. kind of thing that uh, <coughs> you doing your job right, your team doing your job right, we won't really notice. Right. Yeah. You know, that, 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 that's, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the best thing you can say. And the best thing I can say about this film, I think, for my own work and for Mark and for Gimbal is everything. It, it, um, we, it's cohesive. Everything yeah. works to the same end. The visuals, the performance, the direction, the soundtrack, everything kind of, you know, Mark had a vision he wanted to accomplish. We were all on the same page. I mean, I only point this out to say is that's very rarely the case on films, you know. Mm -hmm. And you never know what the response is going to be or even if the film, you know, if the film works in other terms, but the best you can hope for is you accomplished everything that you set out to do mm -hmm. on its own terms. And I think with this, we accomplished that. So that's about. Yeah, it's best, very best you can <laughs> set out for <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. And um, and for for me, a, a hippo moment. Um, I think I think my favorite hippo moment. I have one for you. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think I told you about that. Yeah, yeah. I want, I wonder if it's the same thing. I don't know for sure, but um, I think it is when hippo um, finds Darwin's mask and um, and approaches Buttercup in the living room just because. For me, that's such a it's such a cool moment because it's it, for one thing it's horrifying, but for another thing it's it's you're seeing Hippo truly lose it, and it's like, and you you don't see him smile the entire film on purpose because I, I, I wanted him to be emotionless, but by then he's truly lost it and he's realizing he has to kill his sister who he does love or at least or not kill but like he has to um, cure his sister cure his sister and um, but he he tries to do it dangerously. And you see him, yeah, just, um, just, and he's fully insane. And um, that was the most fun moment for me. It was very electrifying and scary, but like fun. And it was, you could, I, I could feel the energy. You could feel the energy on set. And it was, um, that was my favorite moment, I think. That was mine too. I think I told you on the day. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Will told me on the day, and and um, and I love Will. And what's cool about Will is, I mean this as a compliment. He doesn't give you a lot of compliments. Um, and so when he gives you one, it, you really remember it. And so I remember he gave me a compliment on that day, and I was like, I'm going to remember that forever. You know? Uh, it was just a strike. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's the slow descent, right? But that's the moment, like, his voice is a bit different, his affect, uh, the mask helps, everything kind of came together. Oh, uh, yeah, that's a, yeah. In, in a film full of, um, well, shocking isn't quite the word, but I'll use that for now. A film full of, like, you know, shocking lines, narration, reveals. That's sort of the final, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, he obviously he murdered somebody before this. You know, he's, I mean, it, it, for me, he always felt still kind of like how people talked about a child, you know, kind of performing as something, and this felt like he, you know, in a believable way, Bill enough really to reach something that was, you know, not just a half measure or something, and kind of came to fruition in that moment. So. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> That's beautiful. Especially your eyes in that scene. Thank you. Yeah, that that would actually it was it, it was very yeah it felt. Filled my eyes with water, to put it lightly, in, in the moment, not while watching it. No, was, <laughs> but like, in, you know, um, yeah, it was a, it was a really tense moment on set in a good way. Yeah, in the in the way that you want it to be. Oh, definitely not in the scene. Oh, 
we, we got you. Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't worry. You're, you're, you're right. talking to friendly series. There right. I go rambling. Uh, well, you mentioned one of you mentioned response earlier. You've played this, uh, you've screened this twice now, ever? Yes. yes. And uh, uh, I was at the second showing, and uh, I can say from my experience there that uh, the audience there, which uh, was pretty full house, uh, got what you were laying down. Um, there were some brief remarks about, uh, you know, with filmmakers, people have been with their movies for months and months and months, for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours, having a different relationship with it. I'd be interested in, to hear maybe a little bit about both of your responses to what you saw and the audience response to what you had put together and taking the entirely fresh perspective on this thing that both of you had, I'm sure, had been living with for quite some time beforehand. Sure. Um, I mean, it's obviously always amazing to see your work in the theater, the big audience. Um, I've seen it a million times now, and kind of like you're saying, it's you're so close to something. That's what I was kind of referring to earlier, right, where it's like, your only version of a conflict is, is knowing we made it on the terms we wanted. Does this work for anybody else? Does it work? I have no idea, you know? Um, so to see it get a pretty positive response and laugh at the right parts and, see, you know, and react in the way was, you know, that's, you know, it's like, and I, again, it's just a little bit more distance. I mean, it's almost been two years since we shot it. So I'm still, you know, it's slightly removed myself and enjoy the movie on its own terms now. Um, I think I like it, it more every time I watch it. The first year, even it's I, all I see is my own work for better or for worse. It's hard, you know. I just think about you know every frame you just see outside the frame of when you were there. You yeah. see everything you know parts, so it's hard to separate yourself from that. Um, but yeah, it was definitely quite gratifying. I think to have it play. I mean, this is a very receptive audience. I think at Fantasia in a great way. You know? Yeah, yeah. So it was a really amazing place to premiere it. Yeah, it's, I think we couldn't have asked for like a better place to premiere because the Fantasia audience is like so passionate, and it's and there are some festivals that can be a little snobby, but this one's like everyone's like a passionate film fan, and it's um and yeah, it's 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 work I think we're all proud of, and I think we're just all like, we're just so excited. It's connecting with people because yeah, for a while you do see it so many times, and you're appreciative appreciative of your work, but you're also like, is it funny? Like do you, like because you see it so much that you do get to the point where you're like. You're watching it in a bubble with the people who made it, and you're you're like, I hope this all lands. And but I agree with Will, where it's like, like, for instance, like Andronicus, the short film that we made, made before this. I'm really proud of it, but it is a lot more bleak. Where it's like, I don't really care to rewatch it a bunch because it's pretty dark. Yeah. But um, but this one, it's like it has it has a lot of humor to it, and it's a lot of fun, and it's like I really enjoy watching it with the audiences, and I'm just so glad it's connecting with everyone. Fantastic. Well, that segues uh, fairly nicely because, yeah, you, you mentioned you've worked together in the past, you've worked with Rappaport in the past, and I'm sure there are any number of uh, other overlaps between those projects. Uh, do you have a uh, current idea or a thing in process that you might be able to say anything about? Oh, yeah. Um, so what we, um, the, we, we have a few things in the pipeline, um, the next of which is a thriller about a cult, um, and it uh, takes place in the desert. And Will is shooting it, and um, I play the son of a cult leader, and the cult leader will be um, a wonderful, a wonderful man uh, who has a wonderful name. <laughs> this doesn't make any sense, but uh, but um, it's we, we, we can uh, we can check back on this interview in a couple of years, you know, in a year it, or two when we uh, and, and it'll make sense. See what you're yeah, talking yeah. About. I better pitch, yeah, yeah. I, oh, I wonder, like, how much can I give away? Do I give away the title? I will say this: it's 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 very similar to Heaven's Gate, um, and it's it's a sci-fi thriller about a cult, uh, in their in the days leading up to their cosmic ascension. Um, you might see how things can get pretty crazy before you're supposed to go up, up, up. Uh, certainly, having seen Hippo, yes. Uh, <laughs> And that's, uh, is, is that going, so is that's with Rappaport, I presume? Yeah, yeah, Rappaport's directing. We, we co-wrote it again, and uh, yeah, Will's shooting it, and then um, I... Hopefully the, uh, hopefully we'll be bigger project for us. Yeah, yeah, it's bigger in scope, and hopefully hopefully now that people are really loving Hippo, hopefully we can get, get the finances together to shoot it in the next five... I mean, I would love to shoot it soon, but, <laughs> but you know, because it's been the white whale for a while now. But, um, but... I would, I'm going to put it out there, I think we'll film it in the next eight months. I'm just going to say that really optimistically and who knows if I'll, yeah, let's not find wood. 
Okay, yeah, I guess to take a slight step back before we take our final step together, um, further distribution for Hippo, because you know, this is obviously, this is, this, you know, uh, the few hundred people who caught it here are so far the only people to have seen it. Uh, where is it uh, heading after Fantasia? So we're talking to a number of distributors right now, and I, um, I think the idea is, yeah, hopefully we get a good distributor lined up, and um, probably we'll play a couple more festivals. There's um, already one we heard of, and I imagine um, I imagine it'll play a few more festivals, and then hopefully get distribution and a release, I ideally theatrical, mm -hmm. around. I mean, I would love the, you know, it's a I good mean, October the, movie, but that's the, maybe uh, a little quick. The strike yeah. situation could be potentially in our favor because how oh, yeah. many movies are pushing? Um, big ones because they can't get their actors out there promoting yeah. anything. Uh, our film is obviously nothing to do with yeah, yeah. studios <laughs> or streaming yeah. systems, so yeah. we're well outside of that and have no issue. Yeah, um, our film very luckily has nothing to do with the AMPTP. Yeah, and um, and and I think I think, um, yeah, I think people want to see indies right now and people want to support indies, and so I think we're hopefully, hopefully this kind of returns Hollywood back to its golden age in a way of... Um, That's right. I mean, I'm, all, I'm always optimistic, yeah. but... Did he really? He said he, for, he said he thinks Oppenheimer and Barbie foretell a new golden age. Of really? I mean, I believe him. I would follow... I don't believe that for one second. <laughs> I'm much more cynical, but... Uh, yeah. I would follow Francis Ford Coppola into a volcano, and I would, you know, jump head first if he told me. And you obviously would not. I would not. <laughs> Excellent. So, so those are both uh, fair enough dispositions to have uh, about uh, Mr. Coppola, who, you know, long and storied career, uh, and I'll leave it at that. Um, a question I like to uh, wrap up my reviews with, I have asked everyone I've chatted with, what's your hometown, and can you recommend a restaurant there? Uh, my hometown is uh, Glens Bay, New York, tiny little hamlet. I graduated with my uh, current restaurant, I could probably not tell you, but my family did own a restaurant growing up oh. called the Hawk's Nest Cafe, which is on the Hawk's Nest uh, on Route 97 overlooking the Delaware River. Pretty picturesque, gorgeous. Actually, the, uh, there's a driving sequence in Doctor Strange where he's driving somewhere upstate, and that's where they shot it. Oh. Um, uh, it's, we, our family sells owns a property. For a long time, people thought my dad had burned it down for insurance for property mm -hmm. purposes, but uh, that turned out to not be true. Or if it did, it was a massive failure as far as <laughs> <laughs> recouping. Um, but yeah, I guess that would be my answer. I don't even know. It. I mean, it's so small, I don't even know what there's Well, I, yeah, I guess uh, I'm, you can think more broadly because you, you, you don't live there anymore. No, I no. So I like your current, your current so place yeah. where you hang your head. Oh, in Brooklyn. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, well, Brooklyn, yes. Yeah, Brooklyn <laughs> not, not too fun of an answer. Um, that's where I've been for the last 12 years. Yeah, I don't know if I have a... Oh, that's, that's fair enough. Yeah. Uh, Wait, so a favorite place to eat um, where we're living now? Where we're living now, or whatever you consider your hometown. It can be where you grew up, if that's what you like to think about hometown, where you are now, or maybe... A I mean, no, I have a much better answer. It is technically New York, but it's by far my favorite. So there's a little place called uh, Gaia Italian Cafe, mm -hmm. which closed down. It was this uh, tiny little restaurant that was like uh, in the Lower East Side, but like down some steps, so you can really see it. It was this amazing Italian woman who basically ran it by herself. The prices were like insanely cheap. You get an amazing, authentic Italian community for like five bucks, salads for like seven dollars. It made no sense that she could afford to have the place, make anything work. The hours were like four or five hours a day that it was open. Mm -hmm. um, and then it unfortunately shut down over the pandemic and she had to move, but I found out six months ago that she had reopened about five, six blocks away, which is an even smaller place. <laughs> she looked even more overworked <laughs> and bummed. The food is still amazing. Oh. The prices are like a dollar more. I could not recommend probably anywhere I've been in life more than this place. Uh, Gaia Italian Cafe in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. I love that. Yes. Um, oh, man. I have lots of favorite places. Um, I guess I'll say, well, I grew, I grew up in Goodyear, Arizona, but what's funny about Goodyear, Arizona is the only thing I can think of that was near me was a Whataburger, which is like a Western chain that's actually pretty delicious. Um, the cl I live in Los Angeles now, and the closest one to me is actually six or five hours away directly outside of my childhood neighborhood. 
Um, but what's, but I will say in Los Angeles, I think my favorite place to eat is um, this. There's this Thai restaurant called Night Market that's delicious. It's in West Hollywood, and I think there's another location as well. But um, it is just delicious. Thai, you can't go wrong with Thai food. No. There's oh. also a great Thai food place called Thai Farm Chicken, or Thai Farm Kitchen, my Thai Farm Chicken, um, in Brooklyn. You don't have to put that last one in if you don't want to. I, I, I got data in there. I got paper here. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, no skin off my teeth. But well, thank you very much. It has been an absolute pleasure. And so happy for my sake that uh, your, your travel situation worked out the way that it did. And I imagine that it does allow you to catch some more films here, which... Yeah. Uh, as film people, I, I understand you enjoy it, so... Yeah, yeah, I honestly am kind of glad I brought us back. We just, I can't get enough of the festival, and yeah, we got to do this interview. Yeah. And man, it was amazing. Thank you kindly. Well, thank you again both. I wish Hippo the best of luck. I know I really enjoyed it. Went straight back, whipped up my review, which might have even been published today. Look at that. Uh, I'll have to check. I've been out of my room a lot so yeah. I, will, I will find out later so thank you both again here we have director of photography we have the lead and we have hippo which i strongly recommend you watch when you can Woo! There's, there's a few, but uh, me and Kimbo had come off of Andronicus that Eliza also starred in, uh, that we also shot, and um, and uh, we both started to laugh over COVID and write and just have these long Zoom sessions and what can we write, and uh, we, we, we found that we were both very, uh, had some tra traumatic experiences <laughs> thinking about sex as a child, like, <laughs> really that neither of us really knew what it was until, like, yesterday um, <laughs> <laughs> and and so it started as that um coming from i'm from an orthodox jewish background kimball's uh, grew up mormon um and yeah i'll let you speak with more on that yeah i mean um i feel like i believe in the universe uh more than anything now but i um but wait are we talking about religion oh um uh, i um the movie, yeah. I mean, we were writing other stuff. Uh, we wrote like another <laughs> film first that was about it's about a cult that we're doing next. But it's um, this movie. yeah, yeah. That's uh, it, that one just it's bigger in, in scope. So it took it took longer. <laughs> am I wait? Am I being hilarious? No, it's fine. It's just we had, we want they weren't about this movie. I, yeah, I, I, I over talk, but it's uh, no, you're a creature. We wanted. I'm a creature. Beautiful yeah. creature. Yeah, yeah. I but we wanted to make something we could shoot and. It, because we were eager, yeah. so we were like, let's shoot something in your grandmother's house. So it came from that place, and then it became also a bit of a, a bit satirical on America and 
American puritanical sex culture and how they view it. And the original title was uh, Hippo or the Spectacular Detonation of an American Nuclear Family, hence the Bob Shelter, hence it all coming back, the immigrant winning, winning, uh, or whatever, or just being the, the victor. Um, but we cut it to just Hippo and uh, kept those uh, themes, though, as well against uh, sort of about America, critiquing America and... Uh, yeah. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, did you guys always envision it being in black and white? I think so. Yeah, um, so it's funny. Will, who's taking a picture of me, and <laughs> clearly <laughs> doesn't prefers to communicate visually. Um, he actually wanted us to shoot our short Andronicus in black and white, um, just because he was so into it at the time. I had delayed obsession. I got delayed on his page about black and white. I didn't want to do the short, but I said, let's do the feature. And he was kind of like, uh, not that you were over black and white, but yeah, it's like uh, I was just discovering this beautiful medium for myself, and we just did it, and it really, and we spoke about it, and it worked. And uh, talk more about that. Uh, yeah, I think uh, it's 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 kind of a way to take the edge off the story a bit and kind of place it more in like a fairy tale kind of world. Or and the framing has is very static and stuff, and it's kind of thought like a storybook of sorts. Um, and the black and white scene kind of like placed it in a not exactly tethered to reality, but somewhere else, and it kind of just had this infield place to just feel like it kind of had it all together, especially with all this kind of crazy stuff going on in the story. Yeah, now we talk about color and black and white, like, yeah. you need a, re a reason to shoot color. color. And yeah. the same you need a reason to shoot black and white, but like color is like a bit of a privilege to shoot in color. Honestly, I th I think black and white movies are the best because if you look back, uh, you know, in my opinion, if everyone wants something uh, really great to watch that's... Uh, uh, just at some point in their lives, I recommend uh, A Place in the Sun starring Montgomery Cliff. That's one of the best movies probably ever made. But I think you could go on and on about black and white movies, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s, whatever. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. If it ain't broke, so don't fix it. We want to master the, the first part of cinema history. <laughs> Mark taught me, by the way, not to go on a tangent about black and white. Mark, and this is true, I guess, when babies are first born, they first see in black and white. Now we're getting weird. <laughs> so. um, it's true, such an incredible <laughs> crowd here. I would love to open up for questions uh, or com yeah, all right over here. Um, this is, I guess, a question for both the actors and filmmakers. Uh, for the actors, what was your initial reaction to the script and the scenario? And I guess for the filmmakers, how did you, uh, I guess, pitch or uh, answer any of these questions that were coming from the actors? When I got it, Mark and I have like a similar sense of humor, you know? So like when I got it, I was just like, oh yeah, I see what he's doing here, I got him. Um, <laughs> you know, so that's that's kind of how it worked. I worked with him, we, we, we were here five years ago for a film called Pledge, which is like a horror comedy, yeah. you know? He, so he that's played like, like a really played bad guy. guy. So like, he's good at that. Yeah, so like, you know, we just kind of that kind of, so when I got, when he called me up and was like, you know, I got this script and there's this part I think you can really do. It, uh, like I already, I kind of already knew we had that same sort of irreverent style of humor, so I just gave it one read. Like, this guy's name's Darwin. Like that's kind of all I needed to know. <laughs> <laughs> and that was that. He's got, got like more, more story to go. Maybe tell Lila. Yeah, yeah Lila, just to tell us what you think. <laughs> well, I, I, I tried to read the script with my eyes closed for the entire bit. <laughs> so I was like, I can't really no look at this. How do I read it and get to the next page and have it be okay? So I kind of squinted my way through, and then I was laughing, and I thought there was something wrong with me um, because Andronica said funny things, but not, but not like this. So I, I thought, how do I ask Mark if this is supposed to be a comedy? Because like, if that, that's a terrible question, because either obviously it is, and then it's a bad question, or obviously it's not, and then it's a bad question. Um, but I just thought I'll do anything with him and with and with this guy here and so there was it was sort of even though I closed my eyes through three quarters of the script I knew that I wanted and then she showed up and killed it it was the glue of the family oh. uh, and then the, the, the and matriarch my problem is I don't I cannot cook <laughs> so probably she you never really know if she's a very good cook she's a very energetic cook but she probably sucks and so <laughs> the eggs were great <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think maybe this production design. Uh, is it possible there's a question here? Yeah, sorry, the light is like right oh. there, so I'm just letting you know if you ever watch in the future. 
Uh, yeah, oh, well, thank you all very much, first and foremost. That was an absolute outstanding delight. I have a slightly awkward question for you. Uh, judging from uh, what you uh, tread over thematically here, was there ever a vision of the script where it wasn't an adopted sister? Um, there, was there ever a version where, where it wasn't? Yeah. No, and the reason was, uh, from my point of view, at least, and Jim will tell me if you have a different one, but uh, I, don't, I only have brothers. I have four, I'm one of four brothers, uh, and by the way, that's my mom. She is also my mom. Uh, uh, her for getting us to use her grandma's house, so anyway. My grandma's house. Um, all, all is just to say, I, I never had a sister, so it was only natural to connect with one on a not immediate level. Um, and it just and it gave that intro, and it, it also thematically um, worked for the whole s satire of America to make it adopted. Let's and and play into Lilla's amazing strengths as her a native Hungarian. Like not trying to make Lilla be something she's not, because when she agreed to also do this movie when we met at Berlin, I was like, first of all, I was like. No way. Like, she won a silver rare. Like, she's incredible. How do we get Lilla? Like, we have to make this part tailored for her. So, really, the part is tailored for everyone here. But, yeah, that's also part of it was writing with Lilla in mind made it. It had to be adopted because cause of, uh, cause of who she is. <laughs> but that accent is fake. <laughs> <laughs> um, unfortunately, we have time for just one more question. Uh, right over here. I have a question for Lilla. I've seen your uh, uh, silver bear winner. I don't have any techniques in acting, so um, <laughs> like I am a really intuitive person in in acting and in real life also. So <laughs> no, I, for me always when I'm shooting a movie, it's always like a new new chapter in my life and new movie, new people's new new kind of work method. So no, it's it was it was a right answer or. <laughs> No, yeah, you can put a little, all of these actors, you put them in the environment, and what I love so much about working with them is that they just react to what's around them. Um, and it's like a theater group, as I was talking about last night, too. We're like, uh, yeah, like, I'm directing a movie, but really we're like directing, I'm really just, we're making scenes. We're making uh, every scene with a conflict and a story, and, and the camera, there he is now, making another <laughs> picture. Uh, and we just, yeah, we just want to show and not move the camera too much, and that all plays into letting everyone go with it, just act away. Um, camera's not dictating the story, like the actors, just you guys. Um, so yeah, I, 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 again, I can't say how lucky I am to work with everybody here. And, and as well, Julian, uh, who didn't get a question, from Rough House Pictures, these guys make Righteous Gemstones. I'm so sorry to cut this short, but oh, no it's been such a pleasure. Uh, this was a world premiere. This is a small movie. Like, it has a huge ambition, but like, is a tiny budget, tiny crew. Like, tell people you love it and keep an eye open for everybody on the stage because, like, I feel like this is the future of indie making, filmmaking. So. <laughs>